you know, your brain starts to figure out, you know, is this really what I want? And again, I, it was gut check time. And I said, yeah, because um, I'm determined. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life. You're listening to Unbeatable with Jeff Struker. Welcome to another episode of Unbeatable. I'm Jeff Struker. We've heard stories already from wives who have lost husbands. We've heard stories from uh, musicians that have laid it all on the line. We've heard some amazing stories in the previous episodes, but I'm thrilled to bring an episode to you with somebody who I would like to say is somewhat of a friend. I met Tom Flick many years ago while I was still in the Army and I was living out in the Pacific Northwest. Now, if you don't recognize his name, Tom Flick is a well-known, well-respected corporate speaker. He's a guy who is kind of an expert in leadership, has talked to companies like NASA and Ford and Starbucks and Microsoft and coached leaders about leadership. But he's also a change expert. And we're going to talk in just a few moments about the the leadership and the change um, conversations that he's had with some of the biggest corporations in the world. There's a lot that you can learn from him. But oh, by the way, maybe you recognize Tom's name from playing football in the NFL for seven years. Maybe you remember when he was the quarterback on teams like the Patriots or the Chargers, or when he played for the legendary coach Joe Gibbs at Washington as a quarterback. Tom played in the NFL for about seven years and then left the NFL to to, uh, start speaking at audiences all over the world. If you really, really want to know more about him, you got to go to his website, TomFlick.com. But Tom, I am thrilled that you would take some time to join me and to be my guest on Unbeatable. Jeff, it is a joy to be back together. And I'm going to say that we are friends. Can I jump and bridge that gap and say that we are just because uh, it's a joy to be with you. And it was a neat experience when we first met and now it's reconnected. And so I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, Tom, this is completely off script. We'll just uh, throw the script out the window right out of the the gate. But why don't you just describe everybody how we first met each other um, on this very in this very unusual manner that we met many years ago? You bet. Well, you, as you mentioned, you were out in the Northwest. You were stationed out here at Fort Lewis, and uh, I don't live far from there. A gentleman became a dear friend of mine named Bob Kinder. He was a colonel in the U.S. Army Rangers. He invited me to come to speak with all of you guys, you men. Uh, He said, bring your son, Joe, who was 13 at the time. So we came out, and we had a breakfast together. I spoke to everybody, and then we all went out in this amazing, I think, five- or ten-acre field uh, it's got high ground, low ground trees, open open area where we had paintball wars. And I was the captain of the Delta team, which I thought was really interesting. And we went at a, a kind of a, a shootout. And I was killed instantly right out of the sh- You know, I, I lasted 30 seconds. And my son, who's 13, I think he lasted till the end with a sniper guy. Yeah. So, uh, but in that midst of being together, you and I, you know, struck a conversation and, and stayed in touch a little bit over the years. And now we've been reconnected. So yeah. it's just a joy. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I I just wanted everybody to hear this story. In classic Ranger fashion, we would invite somebody with Tom's expertise and leadership and change, but also his experience in the NFL to come speak to Rangers. And then, oh, by the way, we've got a paintball gun for you. Why don't you come out there and play paintball with us and um, just really take or treat our guests well and shoot paintballs at them from basically point blank range. That's our way of introducing somebody to the unit. Tom, it was fun. I I had a great time, even though I was dead really quick. (laughs) No, thank you again for coming on the show. So let's, let's get started and we'll go way back. Let's talk about your time playing college ball and ball in the NFL um, before stepping away from the league and kind of starting the business that you've been leading for now, almost 30 years. Yeah. Um, You know, I'm one of, one of six kids. I'm uh, four boys, two girls, retired Naval aviator. My father was a commander in the Navy and all born on naval bases, but when you have uh, three other brothers who are all athletic, and man, we just, we had the spectrum. I had a brother who was a surfer, uh, a brother that was a professional skier, another brother that was, you know, we're all, played all the sports, and being number five out of six on the totem pole, you can't help but pick up a ball or a bat or something and, and follow suit, and so 
I, I fell in love with football. I was a better baseball player and I was a good basketball player, but I fell in love with football. And at the age of 13, I told my baseball coach, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play anymore. Here's my glove. You can give it away. I'm going to go be a pro football player and focus my energy on doing that was drafted, not drafted, excuse me, recruited by the university of Washington out of uh, Seattle. Um, I lived in Bellevue right across the lake. And, and so I went there with a new coach named Don James, who then led the Huskies to numerous uh, Rose Bowl championships. And we went to the Rose Bowl my senior year. I was invited to play an all-star teams in Japan and East West Shrine game. Uh, was considered one of the top 100 players in the league or in, the, in college and then was drafted into the National Football League by the Washington Redskins. So that was my journey, Jeff. It was just kind of this, this really highly focused, um, determined kind of mastery goal of learning how to throw a football and, and loving every minute of it. I just, I'm amazed at that story. I, I want to point out what you just said. If you grew up in a big family, you know what this feels like to be uh, Tom, number five out of six children. In big families, you typically have to fight for everything, right? You have to fight for the food at the dinner table. You have to fight for attention from mom and dad. So you, you just learn how to be naturally competitive, right? You nailed it. You, you're right on, you know, there's so many, so many chicken breasts at dinner time when it's being served and and if there's one extra, you know, yeah. jump on it, someone else is going to take it. But, yeah. you know, I, I love my brothers. My oldest brother, John, really taught me how to throw. And he, he had this really clear concept. He said, listen, form and function. He was an all-league defensive back, uh, center fielder, um, guard on the basketball yeah. team. Um, so I played, you know, my, my jun- when I was a sophomore, Jeff, I backed up my brother, Joe, who was one brother ahead of me. He was the starting quarterback. He was a senior. But he also skied for Solomon and K2. He was a professional skier, and he was ranked in the world. And so he made a, a, a conditional kind of pact with my head football coach, our head football coach. He said, you know, three times this season, I'm going to have to leave the game early because I've got events in, in Heavenly Valley or in Vail or someplace. i got to go compete. So he did that. So he would rush for 100 yards or, and throw for 100 yards in the first half, and he's a great quarterback. And then he would leave. He would go and f- catch a plane and fly, and I would take over the team. So I love the it. The flicks were kind of known around yeah. the neighborhood as pretty athletic family. I love it. You two became the one-two punch on the football field. But I, I'm, I'm just blown away by the language that 13 years old, you understood that you wanted to pursue football and yeah. you made a goal that I'm going to play in the NFL. Is that right? It is. You know, it's really what it does to the brain in the sense when you really, um, well, he, here's a concept. Let me throw a concept and I'll come back to the story. But if the concept is turning pro, if you were to ask your audience listening and I was to say to your audience, hey, everybody, if you're going to become a pro golfer, on the women's or men's tour, what would you do? And the answer would be, if you're serious about it, and it was really the heart of your hearts, you would drop everything. You'd be swinging the club five, six hours a day. And so what happens in life, many times we're, we just remain amateurs. We remain amateurs in lots of areas of our life, but to turn pro means you really do something different. And so I, I determined at the age of 13, I said, you know, I don't want two different throwing motions. Uh, I, I know what I want to do, so why don't I just go do it? And so what that caused in my brain, so just the next year, um, this is pre-Seattle Seahawks being a franchise in Seattle. What they did is a lot of NFL teams would play exhibition games in Husky Stadium. They would come to Seattle for the purpose of wooing Seattle to maybe get the next franchise. And so what I did and how my brain worked is I thought, well, okay, great. So I would show up. Uh, Saturday morning, the game's on Sunday, I would show up at Husky Stadium, I'd climb over the locked fence, my mom would drive me out to the stadium, drop me off, All right. and I'd be waiting in the f- at the field for the team to do their Saturday walkthrough, and I would walk up to the general manager, not general manager, excuse me, the, the head trainer, and I said to the trainer, I said, listen, I'm the local kid who won the radio contest to be your ball boy for the game, and so what do I do? And the guy's like scratching his head going, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, there's a contest. I, I, I'm so excited. What do I do? All right, kid, go grab that bag over there and get this. And so I warmed up Joe Namath. I warmed up Dan Fouts. Uh, I did a lot of things. as a 13-year-old kid in Husky Stadium. And all my friends would go, how did you get down on the field? And because I had that 
I give turning pro. I said, I'm not letting get anything. And so how can I get ahead of the, the, the curve? Right. Right. And so that's where your brain goes. So. Yeah. All of your friends, when they asked you, how did you get on your field on the field? You were thinking in the back of your mind, you're a bunch of amateurs. Let me tell you what the <laughs> pros do. <laughs> Turn pro and you'll find right, out. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I I mean, if you were to just look at Tom's football career, both college and professional, you you really got to be impressed. Tom, you went from playing ball with the Huskies, as you described. You were on the Rose Bowl championship team your senior year, and then you go into the NFL, drafted in the fourth round. So tell me about some of the hurdles that it took to make it all the way into the, the, the highest levels of football, to make it into the National Football League. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot of, you know, this being a ranger, Jeff, an ex ranger. I mean, I think you end up being a ranger for life, right? You take right. those things that you learned and that's why you've taken it into ministry. You've taken it into the podcast that you've got going and you take it into family life. And it's the same thing for me. I mean, I learned so many things, grit and toughness and perseverance and discipline. But when I was, I, I joined, I came to the university of Washington and the first practice padded practice that I was in, um, we had a run drill. And so I handed off to a big fullback. The fullback, people may know, may not. His name was Robin Earl. He happened to be 6'5", 258. And he ended up playing for the Chicago Bears for 11 years as a tight end. But anyway, I handed off to Robin and my arm got stuck in there with the football and, and he clamped down on the ball and my arm was in there. I didn't get it out in time. And he dragged me through the hole, literally dragged me. I'm on the ground. He's running with me kind of behind him. And I remember he got off the ground after being tackled and he looked down at me and he said, stupid, what did he say? Stupid freshman. He said, You're a stupid freshman, you know. And yeah. that was my first practice. And I bounced up from that and I went over and I had, I had to talk to myself. I said, okay, this is, everything's moving fast, really fast. And I sat there and I had a gut check and I said, can I compete? And I said, yeah, I can. I can compete. And I, I strapped on my helmet and went back in there. And I got to tell you, that's what I learned first and foremost. But I, so I played, I backed up a guy named Warren Moon. I just figured I'd let Warren start his career, not interrupt it. And right. I'll come in afterwards. But yeah, of uh, course. So I'm a backup to Warren and I play, uh, you know, a little tiny bit at the end of the season as a freshman, as a true freshman. But my sophomore year, I sprained an ankle. Well, let me back up. In spring ball. I'm actually playing so well that I, I take over the number one quarterback job away from Warren and playing great and just everything's just in sync and in sync. And I, it could have been, I was playing great, but coach James could have also done that as a wake up for Warren, who is a phenomenal football mm-hmm. player in the hall of fame. Of course. I mean, I'm not saying I'm yeah. better than Warren. That's not what I'm conveying here. But, uh, but I, anyway, when we're scrimmaging and I had that, I was moved to the first team uh, during scrimmage. I separated my shoulder and it was on my throwing shoulder. I went back in the huddle, called the play, went to the line of scrimmage, had a, a play, a pass called and I threw it. And this, this electric shock went down my arm and I was taken out and they said, you're, you know, you have a, an injury and you're going to have to red shirt. So anyway, from that, it was a decline. I sprained my ankle the next uh, fall. I started to lose ground and it was really a challenge to say, Man, I started to think, you know, should I go to another college? You know, your brain starts to figure out, you know, is this really what I want? And again, I, it was gut check time. And I said, yeah, because um, I'm determined. And uh, so I, I stayed with it. And, and that's what I got out of it. I, and I use that to this day. Those stories, those things I reflect, pop back in my mind. And I go, you know, it's just take a gut check, figure out where you're at, slow down, um, get your bearings and then figure out what you want to do and then go. And then you can, then you can go fast. Yeah. So I jump back into it. Thanks Tom. The, that's the perfect way of describing the whole reason why this podcast exists. It's guys and gals that have just been given a punch in the gut. And now you have to decide how, how serious am I? How committed am I? And, and you face that more than a few times. Um, I want you to tell everybody about your third year in the league because you went from Rose Bowl championship to playing ball in the NFL as a quarterback and your third year in the league, you go through a pretty intense injury. So why don't you describe that and just explain what it took to go through that gut check that you just described? Jeff, if you don't mind, I think it's probably valuable for your listeners. If I, if I jump uh, one year ahead of that. Sure. 
starting my second year in the NFL, I was drafted by the Washington Redskins. I was the third quarterback drafted in the NFL that year and, and uh, had a good rookie season. I loved the Redskins, loved my teammates. And I went home. And the reason I went home in the off season, because back then it wasn't a requirement that you lived there in the off season. My father, the previous year as a test pilot, uh, had a serious crash, broke his back, leg, arms, rib, uh, fractured everything was given his rights many times uh, so through my senior year I he was there in a hospital you know had a body cast for four months wow. but when I was drafted and went off to the NFL he uh, still was recovering and then he had staph infection uh, I was called a couple of times during training training camp hey you know your father dad might not make it so that was in the back of my mind and anyway long story short I stayed home during that off season that second year off season and that did not go well with Coach Gibbs. Um, and so when we got into training camp, I was playing well in training camp, but I was getting hammered by Coach Gibbs in, in offensive meetings. You know, I'd hit the cross route, but he would stop the film and go, listen, we've got the go route. we got inside coverage technique. That's where I want the ball to go. And, you know, Gaudis would come and say, man, you're getting hammered by the coach. Why'd you get on his bad side? I love Joe Gibbs. I yeah. love Joe Gibbs. Um, he, he was a great influence in my life. Anyway, long story short, he came to my room one night after curfew and he said, let's go for a drive. I said, all right. And we went for a drive and he said, uh, I'll tell you why I've been on you. I, I expected you to be back here in the off season being the leader. I drafted you and, uh, and you weren't here. You, and I said, I didn't know you want, I'd never heard it as a requirement. I was here for all the OTAs and all that type of stuff. So anyway, we came to an understanding and I thought things were fine <laughs> until the next morning I am walking to it's training camp, the end of training camp and I'm walking to, uh, to breakfast and a lot of my teammates are going and coaches are walking by going, Hey, you know, good to see you. And how are you today? I'm going, something's up. Yeah. And coach Gibbs is, we have a two days that day and coach Gibbs says, Hey, uh, I don't want you to practice today. I said, what, what for? He goes, I just, just take it easy. I don't want you to get injured or hurt. And at the end of practice, he called me over and said, here's the deal. We've traded you. We traded you to New England. And as soon as he said those words, I cut him off. I said, but I don't want to hear it. I get it, you know, yeah. and I left. And in 24 hours, I was suited up with the Patriots flying to Dallas to play the Cowboys in the last exhibition game. And I got to tell you, I've never been on, knocked off my – off my pedestal, off yeah. my foundation of who I was at that moment in my life ever. And I was, you talk about lost, I was lost because I grew up with an image performance based perspective. How I played on a Friday night in high school, a Saturday in college, and a Sunday in the NFL determined how I lived th Monday through Thursday. I was on this roller coaster of pressure and stress and didn't know it. And so if I played well, then I really felt good. But if I played bad, you know, oh, so down on oh, myself. Yeah. And it's, it's a vicious cycle. We go there often as Americans, I think, uh, because of our just focus on success and achievement. Mm -hmm. And from that, I surrendered my life uh, to Christ. And uh, going now to that, that third year, uh, you know, that's when I was released. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, I, or anyway, I, I was injured. And so that's kind of, I'm starting to get a little confused, but that's kind of the start of it yeah. is that, that episode. Well, I want to just take a pause real quick and describe for people who are listening to this episode, who have put their entire life into this business. And then all of a sudden the industry fell apart and you just went bankrupt, or maybe it was a divorce and you poured everything you had into the marriage and had a spouse sit down at the dining room table and say, I found somebody else and it's over. And you know what it feels like to hear what Tom just heard when Coach Gibbs looks you in the eyes and says, hey, man, we've traded you. And you basically built your entire adult life for the moment that you're in when it all gets pulled out from underneath you. Man, thank you for sharing that story with us. You stay in the league. You start playing ball well. You get a couple of years in, and then all of a sudden you have an injury your third year in the NFL. Would you talk about that injury a little bit? 
Yeah, you know, first of all, the injury, uh, it's, it was just a challenge to, the injury happened, Jeff, so let me clarify. I, when, I got, when I got injured, um, uh, I got traded to New England. So I, Redskins, in, uh, incident with Gibbs, um, which I count as a blessing, and I'll tell mm -hmm. you why that is in just a moment. And not at the time, certainly, but now I'm just so thankful for it. Was traded to New England, uh, played for New England in 82. Going into the 83 season, I injured my arm. And I'm now required to go get Tommy John surgery. Our team doctors uh, said, you know, I couldn't even grip a football. Wow. And so I said, do you mind if I go get a second opinion? Can I go back to Seattle with our team doctor for the Huskies? He's, a, he's an excellent physician. Can I get a second opinion? They said, absolutely. They flew me back to Seattle. And while there, a friend said, hey, um, haven't seen you a long time. I'm going to a Bible study. You want to join? And I said, yeah, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm spiritual enough. I was raised, you know, I went to church as a kid. I don't, I don't cuss that often and I don't smoke or drink. So, you know, I'm good enough, but I'll come just to see you. That was kind uh -huh. of the, the, the way my brain was working. And I went there and I heard the, this guy share the gospel for the first time. Uh, the gospel means good news. And man, it was good news for me because he shared about uh, the life of Jesus. Now, Jesus loves me more than I could even love myself. And that Jesus wanted to give me an abundant life, which means a value worth side of life, not an image performance side of life. And, and that he died for my sin. And, and, and I, in the midst of 35 people I never had met before in my life, I raised my hand and said, Hey, I've got an issue. I've got a, I have a question. Huh. And the guy goes, what is it? And by the way, what's your name? And I said, what's your question, Tom? And I said, by what you're saying, I'm, a, I'm broken in some way, shape, or form. And how do I get fixed is what I said. And he said, come on up here. And I went up. And he said, uh, you've been living your life for yourself. I said, essentially, yeah, I get that. And he says, well, you need to repent. It's a Christian word. But what it means is just you turn a 180. You just go the opposite direction. You go towards God instead of towards yourself and all your desires of your heart. All right. And so I asked God to come in my heart. And instantaneously, I felt the pressure of the world leave me. Literally, I just said, Lord, I'm, and by the way, it's, I'll just say this. It's a wonderful day when you realize you're a sinner. You know why it is? Because then until that time, you don't realize you need a savior. We all need one, yeah. but you don't realize okay. it. And when you realize you need one and there is one, man, you just go, this is great news. Yeah. And God washed me clean. I think that's the best thing. He didn't make yeah. me perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I still stumble and, and fall, but he's my father, heavenly father. So, so that, that, that's the impetus. So what I did when I finished, I just, my prayer was as a young, brand new Christian was, God, if you don't want me to play football, that's great. I don't care anymore. What do you want me to do in life? And this is no joke to the day, six days, seven days after that, one week later, I'm back in Boston. I'm ready for surgery in three days. My arm is totally healed. What? Um, what they used to do, Jeff, and for your audience, you can see my hand, the way that they would test ulneritis or Tommy John is they would poke your finger at least they did for me. They draw blood. I couldn't feel it because I was so numb down my arm. That's why I couldn't grip a yeah. football. I couldn't have the use of the last two fingers. Uh, I picked up a football. I, I could grip it. I could throw it. Um, my grip strength was is where it used to be. I, I was totally and completely healed. And so uh, because of that, I stayed in the league for the next four years. And uh, and so that's kind of the miracle. And I, I don't use miracle, the word miracle lightly, but I would say that was one that happened yeah. in my life. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm blown away by the miracle week that you had where God both healed you soul and body and could continue to play in yeah. the league for four more years, gave you four more years basically to play in the league. Um, it did, but it also gave me a responsibility that I never was aware of. And that was to be, you know, so, so anyway, I get traded from, uh, New England to Cleveland. Uh, I'm arriving in Cleveland my first day there in the off-season training, and there's a guy waiting for me. His name is Ozzie Newsom. Ozzie Newsom was the general manager of the Baltimore Ravens, is a Hall of Fame all-pro tight end, mm -hmm. one of the best ever to play, obviously Hall of Fame. And he's there, and he says, I said, hey, 
He goes, hey, Tom, I'm Ozzy. I said, hey, I know Ozzy. How are you? It's so nice to meet you. He said, he says, I've been waiting for you. I said, really? How come? Why? He says, well, I wanted to tell you a couple of things. It, it, just to welcome you first, but I want you to know that, that um, on Tuesdays, we have a Bible study. There's four or five of us that go to that, and we get discipled. Uh, Thursdays are Bible study nights where our team guys, believers, get together. And before games, we have chapel. I just wanted you to know that, and welcome to the team. Wow. I thought, wow. Yeah. And so I was in a huddle one time. I remember I was in a huddle, Jeff, and humid days in Cleveland. And I'm in the huddle, and I see Ozzy's got a little cross on the tip of his, painted with a Sharpie pen on the tip of his right cleat toe. And I said, what's with the cross? And he said, you know, it's so hot out here and two days are a grind. And he said, I get in the huddle. I have 20 seconds to just kind of catch my breath. When I put my hands on my knees, look down at my shoes, I see the cross of Christ. And it just reminds me what he did and what he sacrificed for, for us to have a relationship. And I said, I can go give everything I've got. I actually became a better athlete when I became a Christian because I stopped playing for accolades. I started to pray, play for just the joy of yeah. playing my, and the gifts that my father gave. I started yeah. playing to the audience of one, wow. so to speak. So yeah. hugely different. Great story. I was about to ask you to tell us some of the pressure that you felt while you were in that huddle in the NFL. I mean, going from playing college ball at the highest levels, which University of Washington in the Rose Bowl, that's a that's some that's stress. But when you go to play ball in the NFL with some of the greatest players on earth and you're relatively new to the game and they're looking at you and you're the quarterback bringing in the call. So tell us a little bit about the pressure that you felt while you were in the huddle or on the field in the NFL. Well, you know, in, in the environments that you and I have lived in, in the NFL and being in the army Rangers, um, as I said earlier, speed, things move really, really fast. And the only thing that prevents great athletes from moving on to the next level is the fact, can they accommodate the speed? Yeah. Can they play it? fast pace. And again, I had that kind of gut check. And I remember in a, in a scrimmage uh, with the Redskins, my rookie year, at the very beginning, I hit this, this uh, fade route. I just stuck it. Be it just, it was a perfect throw. All right. And I had this big old time lineman come up to me and just grab me and shake me. Hey, rookie, that was a heck of a throw, you know? And I kind of knew like, okay, I'm here. I, I can do this. But, but pressure is a relative thing because I, I find a way to alleviate pressure. And what you learn as a quarterback is preparation. And when you're prepared, you can really, you can really play. And, it, and what you want, as you know, football in, in your world too, it's a reactionary environment. It's not a thinking. It, there is thinking involved, but when you get into the thick of things, it's reactionary. All the training that you've had, just, just it happens. And so it's the same with a football player. And if not, if you think in football – uh, in your world, it's much more serious, but in football, you get, you get killed, clobbered, you get killed in yeah. your sport or your world. So, you know, you try and alleviate that as much as you can. You know, when I played and was drafted by these teams, I, I literally, I was a football fan. I want, you know, John Riggins was a teammate of mine. I thought, God, would it be weird if I asked him for an autograph, you know, when I first got there, would that be kind of odd yeah. to do? Because, you know, you're just like, wow, I'm playing with John Riggins or, you know, all these guys that end up in the Hall of Fame. Right. So it's just, it's just a fun experience. I love football so much. But as I moved forward from becoming a Christian, I loved the sport more. Less pressure was on my shoulders. God didn't judge me or not love me if I played bad. I didn't love myself if I played bad before that, right? Yeah. So I started moving through this process of really growing in Christ. Um, each team I went and played for, I played then for the Chargers and uh, started to be more of a leader uh, in the uh, in the mm -hmm. locker room as far as setting Bible studies and so forth. And then I got to the Jets, and that was an interesting experience when I came to the Jets. Uh, I'm starting, I played eight, the year of 87 with the Jets in 88. It's my eighth year in the league. I probably was never more prepared in my life. I, I was, you know, you get to a certain level where the experience is, you know, I can, I've got experience. I know what I'm doing. I'm finally getting this after eight years. But for some reason, when I practiced, I, I just, I didn't practice well. For some reason, that, that mental state of mind was lost, and I couldn't get it. And my coach, Joe Walton, head coach, called me into his office when they said, hey, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're not, you're not playing well. What's going on? I said, I can't figure it out. I, I don't know. 
And I was released about four weeks into training camp. Wow. And I went home. And when I went home, I just, um, my, I just didn't know what was going on. I just sat there. And so another teams it's, this is an interesting story. If you don't mind, I'm sorry if I don't sure. want to ramble, but I'm yeah. going to be succinct as I can. So the Rams call me up, John Robinson, head coach of the Rams says, Hey Tom, you know, the system, can you fly down here and throw for, if your, your arms in shape, we want to sign you to contract. They go down and throw arms in shape. He says, great. We love you. We're going to sign you to a contract on Monday. I went down on a Friday. We're going to sign you up on Monday, stay in a hotel. We're going to get you going on the roster. Monday comes, they said, hey, uh, listen, Jim Everett is healed faster than we thought, and so we're going to send you home. Sorry. I get home. As soon as I walk in the door, the Houston Oilers call me. <laughs> and they said, hey, Warren Moon got banged up. Would you fly down if you throw the ball well and you're still in shape? We, you know, we want to sign you to kind of go down and throw the ball great. <laughs> they said, it's fantastic. Listen, hang tight in a hotel for a couple of days. We're going to sign you to a contract. Two days pass, I go in to sign the contract. They said, hey, we've got to change the plans. We have to, you know, activate somebody else. We're going to send you home. I'm flying home from the Houston airport. And I'm on the plane. I'm saying, Lord, there's obviously, obviously something that you've got going on in my world. I don't know what it is, but I'm curious. And I go home. The phone rings again. And it's my brother, Joe. And uh, he's two years above me. I love my brother, Joe, as I love all my brothers, but I love him so much I named my son after him. Mm -hmm. And on the end of the line, he is fighting back tears, having a hard time saying the words, mom has been diagnosed with cancer, pancreatic cancer. She's been given about three months oh, to live. And he can't say in another word and hangs up. And right then I sat down in a chair and I said, Lord, that's exactly yeah. why I'm not on a football team yeah. because my mother and father were in the country of Ireland. They're not Irish. Uh, we're not a wealthy family. We're just a little, you know, middle-class family, but they had a once in a lifetime chance as they were retired to go to, to go to England and Ireland. My mom contracted pancreatic cancer was jaundice. She was in a small little hotel or a hospital in Shannon Ireland. That night I flew uh, the next day I flew from Seattle to New York, from New York to Shannon Ireland. Uh, to London, then to Shannon, Ireland, and met my father who looked like he had aged 10 years mm. at the airport. We went to a little bed and breakfast where they had stayed. The next morning, uh, we woke up at eight together and walked into a Shannon, Ireland, to a little whitewashed hospital, walked up three flights of stairs to a room that had about six patients in it, all uh, surrounded by their own curtains, uh, opened a curtain, pulled up a chair, and there's my mother. And uh, so I would be there every morning at eight o'clock and we would leave at eight o'clock. And on about the sixth day that I'd been there, we're trying to get her out. We're trying to mm -hmm. extricate her out of the country to get back to get American health care. Um, she is looking up at the ceiling and she's got this blank look across her face. And I said to her, mom, are you okay? And she responded and said, I'm scared to death. And I said, and I pulled my chair closer and I grabbed her hand and I said, mom, I'm going to ask you some questions. I said, um, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And if you were to stand in front of Jesus and he was to say to you, Gene Flick, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And she turned away from me, Jeff, and she could tell she's looking up into the right and she's thinking. And then she finally turns back and says, you know, I've been the best mother I could possibly be, and I would just hope, and I would pray that God would allow me into his mm -hmm. heaven. And I had the greatest mother in the world, and I said, Mom, uh, can I tell you, can I, can I share what God thinks about heaven? Um, you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Uh, you can't buy it. He actually wants to give it to you freely. And all you have to do is open a gift. And that gift is a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And in that relationship and your repentance of that, that means that you're a child forever. And he'll wash you clean from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. And you are forever a child of God. And your name then gets written into a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And so on the end day of the world, that book will be open and your name will be in it and you'll spend eternity with your Lord and Savior. 
And it's like Christmas, right? I mean, you can only do one of two things with a gift. I said to my mom, either receive it or reject it, right? There's no middle ground with a gift, you know? And my mom, uh, at that moment when I was sharing that, she passes out. So she, she falls asleep. She's exhausted. I get no response from her. She just literally wow. closes her eyes. And I sat there for a moment and I prayed and I said, Lord, did she actually hear anything mm-hmm. I said? Did she even understand anything that you said through me? And I went back to that bed and breakfast with my dad. The next morning, we crossed the threshold into that same room at 8 a.m. like we'd done the last seven days. And we look across the room and the curtains are open. There's a woman sitting up in her bed. It's my mother. And she is actually laughing and crying simultaneously. And she blurts out the words, come, each of you, come close quickly. Hold my hands and pull the curtain shut. I've got news I've got great news for you, Tom. Last night, and we hurry to her side and grab her hands, and we have, we don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. If she's delirious, and she last night after you left, I left, I woke and I said, "Jesus, this is Jean. Would you please save me?" And I've been dancing with the Holy Spirit all night, and I said, "I know that I'm a sinner, but it doesn't matter because God's washed me clean. I know that I'm going to die soon, but that doesn't matter either. I know that I'm going to heaven." I've been born again. I have a relationship. I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. And my father didn't know what to do with that. He was like, so we sat and we cried, and we cried and we cried with great joy. Um, And so that's the greatest reason why I was traded by Joe Gibbs, uh, learned the gospel Mm -hmm. when I got injured, and then was released from the Jets to go home and taken out of football to share the gospel with my mother. And I wouldn't trade any of those difficulties or hardships for anything in the world. Yeah. Talk about being unbeatable, um, an unbeatable spirit. Um, I I just want to point out to, uh, to the listeners what you just said, because you have multiple teams that are calling you and saying, Hey, I want you to come. I want you to throw, we're going to sign you. And if any of those teams would have signed you, you probably don't end up in Ireland right there with your mother by her side, able to have that conversation with her and uh, see her go through this amazing change by um, becoming a new woman in Christ. Yeah. It's really so true. Any any of those factors are changed on the dials. You know, God's working these, you know, dials, so to speak, we think, but you know, he, 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 he's, he cares about us so much. And some of the difficulties is this process of pruning or perfecting you and me and us. And, and it actually, if you, if you hang around with the father enough, you realize when a difficult time comes, you can actually look at it and say, all right, this may not be fun, but I know there's something good at the end right. of it because he's faithful. And when I'm not faithful, he remains faithful. So it's, a, it's an amazing set of circumstances. Um, it, it's just, and I'm just excited. And what that does, Jeff, it, it allows me to wake every morning with this great anticipation about what's going to happen. What other thing is God doing behind the scenes is going to reveal itself today. And so life becomes this really exuberant and joyful journey of yeah. excitement. Yeah, the unbeatable men, men and women are guys and gals that have something inside of them that gets them up in the morning and helps yeah. them face those obstacles and difficulties oftentimes where they are in over their head and they need this internal strength, um, the strength that you're hearing from Tom that comes from the spirit of the living God. Yeah, you're so right. Thank you. Tom, we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing now, but before we transition to the the company that you lead and the, and the corporations that you've spoken to, I just want to take a moment to talk about some of the teams that you've had a chance to play on. Let's just be honest. You've had a chance to play with some of the greatest players in the league, many Hall of Famers. But I'm going to do a little segment. We do this every episode. I try to have a little bit of fun here. Um, We call this segment High Five, and it's basically a top five question. So when I was thinking about this with you, I was thinking the top five players that you would love to have on your dream team, anybody in the on the planet, as long as they're still alive, I'm going to tell you my top five. And then I want you to tell me your top five. Like if you could pick five people to be on the, on the field with you playing ball with you, who would those top five be? 
I was thinking about this this week um, on an airplane, and I was thinking, Tom, I've never played professional sports of any kind, but if I were playing football, let me tell you who my dream team would be. This is like <laughs> NBA-style dream team, except for on an NFL gridiron. Uh, the number one player that I think I would want on my dream team is Simone Biles, because if she can get the ball and if anybody could tackle this girl, she could probably do three or four backflips over them. They would never be able to get their hands on her long enough to bring her to the ground. <laughs> number four on my list is or number two on my list is if it's not Simone Biles with the ball, then I'm going to hand the ball off to Usain Bolt. And hopefully if somebody can make a hole through the defense, that guy can make it to the end zone before anybody else can even get close to him. I think I want a, a player on the team next to me like Dwayne Johnson, who maybe is the fullback and who can bust through just about any, any, uh, defensive line and create a hole big enough to drive a truck through because that's the size of Dwayne Johnson's deltoids. But in the huddle next to him, the next guy on my top five list would be Kevin Hart. And I don't even know if Kevin Hart knows what to do with the football, but I would just love to hear Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart next to each other in the huddle, having fun with each other. Cause every time I see those two guys together, they have the best time together. So I just want to hear them in the huddle, having fun with one another. And then the last person that I would put on my top five list of NFL dream team is Pope Francis. Because if it gets to the last play of the game and I got to throw the ball in the end zone, if I'm throwing up the Hail Mary, I want Pope Francis on my team just praying for me when I throw the ball up in the end zone. That's my top five players on my dream team. If buddy, you could you nail it. And, and uh, your little buddy, who's the fourth one? The guy, Kevin uh, Hart. Just Kevin Hart, the size hanging of out, football. Yeah, just hanging out next to Dwayne Johnson and having fun, cutting up jokes in the, in the huddle. Yeah. Tom, what about you? If you could pick anybody, who who would yeah, your top and five be? I didn't be? know they needed to be alive. You know, I saw that quite, I didn't see the question. It was the last on the list. I saw it just before we went on, so I didn't have the chance to think about it. And then I thought about a lot, you know, who's alive? Uh, you have to be, so I didn't, I've had all my people are Okay, dead. well, it's all right. Even if they're dead, tell me who your and, top five uh, would well, be. Well, first I'd have as the coach, you know, um, would be Jesus, right? You yeah. know, I mean, I, I would want his blessing, right? Of course. Over our, our play. But uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, I, I, that's a hero of mine. So I'd love him in there. He would give the greatest speeches, right? I mean, he's a wordsmith. He's a master. At, yeah. I mean, if you read a book called The Eloquent President, you'll get a sense of how much he cared about every single word he ended up saying. So he would be one of them, obviously. Uh, I'm looking at a list if I wrote anything down. Sure. I'm thinking um, of Lincoln in the locker room at halftime when you're down by a whole lot of points. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, in my huddle, would, I know who would not be there, and that's Tom Brady, just because I'm the quarterback. <laughs> right, that's school. right. I don't want him Tom, get your own that. team. This is my dream team, not yours. Yeah, no. I, you know, I, I find uh, there's some people I just never had time to spend time with. You know, there's there's these CEOs that I get to meet, and people that I walk away and go, wow, that's a fascinating person. I would love to have that person on. And I don't have the 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 reasons why my guys are in the huddle but there's people that i would love to be in my huddle so to speak my dream team huddle that i would love to sit down with yeah and just listen and sit at their feet and say I, you know i would love to know more about you and how you function that way and how you see the world that way and so you know churchill would be one of those oh, people yeah. i would love to have in my yeah, huddle absolutely you know, just in those types of experiences i said lincoln obviously um martin luther king yeah. I would love to have MLK Jr. just there and go, you know, Dr. King, walk me through it. Right. You know, I just admire him so much about, you know, we're not judged by the color of our skin, but the by the content, content of our character. Of our, character. Yeah. It's our character that matters more than anything in the world. How I treat you, how I serve you, how I respect you is, and that's a character issue, not a color issue. Yeah. Um, and then Rosa Parks. I've always thought about Rosa Parks, you know, who's really quiet. If you read anything about Rosa, she's very j just grace filled, soft spoken, uh, but a, just a strong woman who wow. finally says enough's enough, you know. And I, I think the way her character shines so brightly is someone who would want in my huddle. Right. So that's a huddle of really of minds. All right. That would be kind of be my all pro yep. team. And I would love to be have them just sit around and talk. Would that be amazing? Sounds awesome. 
let's Great take a question too, yeah, by the way. Let's take a few moments now and just kind of talk about the way that you lead people now. You you've had the chance, as I said a few moments ago, to 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 talk to some of the biggest and most influential leaders and corporations on on the planet. Um, you talk about leadership a lot, and the world has gone through this crazy um, pandemic and unprecedented times. I, I'd like for you to just describe a little bit about some of the things that you talk to leaders about as you describe leading through difficulties, leading through an adversity, the people that are listening to the unbeatable that are struggling with hardships. What are some of yeah. the things that you say to leaders at this point? Well, first of all, Jeff, we're le living in a, what's called a, a, con a world of continuous change. We used to live in a world of, that would, could be labeled as episodic change, which means 40 years ago, change would roll around, a company would put together a committee to fight it and defeat it so we could, quote, get back to normal. Well, that's not the case with globalization and technology and competition. So the world's moving really fast. And no longer can one senior leadership team lead the change alone. Mm -hmm. And so what they need to do is drive leadership down through the ranks. We need to empower more people to lead. When I use the word leadership, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, the title and the position of a leader. I'm talking about the actions and behaviors associated with leadership. I'm talking about self-leadership. I'm talking about vision and strategy, communicating vision and strategy, motivating action, getting buy-in, inspiring people. Uh, removing barriers. So it's, it's this, whether you're a sales leader, an executive, a mid-level manager, a frontline employee, it applies to everybody. And so, and so the biggest, the biggest challenge is, is that the default setting in your brain and the default setting in my brain is management. It just is. It's where the brain mm -hmm. goes. Um, management is an amazing set of actions and behaviors. It's given us the modern day corporation. The only problem with management and management, by the way, just for clarity, is budgeting, staffing, controlling, smart problem solving, planning. Henry Ford did us an amazing favor by perfecting it. But again, it takes management is taking complexity and making it simple or repeatable. Leadership is wholly different. Leadership is vision and strategy, mm -hmm. communicating vision and strategy, motivating action, getting buy-in, removing barriers, uh, taking complex systems and people and creating innovation opportunities and growth. Leadership is about uh, playing defense where, um, excuse me, management is about playing defense where leadership is about playing offense. How about that? Uh, management would be uh, avoiding hazards, leadership seizing opportunities. Management is about who and how. Leadership is about what and why. Management's reliable and efficient. Leadership is agile and fast. So, so I, we need to be leaders, better leaders. And yet we're seeped in management. So I try and level the teeter-totter out in people so they can perform faster. We can't we can't keep going 80 miles, 40 miles an hour when the world's going 80. Yeah. So that's why organizations hire me to bring me in and say, okay, how can we get our companies to move faster with less chaos and yet still achieve success? And there's a way to do that because there's obstacles in, in this process of a faster moving world and being oversteeped in management. So that's what, I, that's why I'm hired. And I hired to, I keynote, I keynote lots of conferences mm -hmm. and meetings and senior leadership team meetings. Uh, organizations then bring me in to do half-day workshops and full-day workshops around these concepts and how they really in inculcate those and get them tied into strategy. So that's what God called me to do 30 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since, and, and I love it. It's, yeah. it's an amazing career. And I could see why you would be in high demand then, because you get a chance to talk about change. By the way, I didn't have a chance to say this to you, um, one of the guys that I probably respect the most in academic circles, um, you've had a chance to sit down and spend some time with John Cotter, yeah. um, and learn a little bit about how to become an expert in change. And right now the world is just inundated with the challenges that change brings along. In fact, I tell people in almost every language change or the version that language is native version of the word change is pretty much a dirty word. Everybody fears change because change means the unknown, or maybe I've been burned in the past when I tried to embrace some change. So the last question that I really want to spend a moment or two with Tom is how do you coach people that are struggling with the fear of change when in an, in a world, as you said, that's moving 80 miles an hour and rapidly changing around you? Great question, Jeff. Well, the other component or part of my work is I believe, you know, it's a part of engaging the heart. 
uh, you know, in our heart, our best efforts emerge, right? And so, you know, and that might seem, you know, years ago that, oh, okay, that's soft leadership, you know, but no, it's not. It's really moves the dial more than anything else. And so when I talk about teams, I talk about leadership. I talk about how to grow teams. The, and, you know, it's like, it's like a great movie or a great book. You've got to have a protagonist and an antagonist to make it work. And so there's elements that cause us to stop. And you mentioned John Cotter. Uh, John is a friend of mine who I'm honored to say that. And John is the world's foremost authority mm -hmm. by Forbes and Time Magazine on change leadership. He is the uh, youngest tenured professor in the history of, this, of Harvard University. John is about seven years of age. He's written more books. He's the number one seller of books on Amazon, top 1%, excuse me. So I've been mentored by John to some degree. And so, uh, so that's what we go into. But, you know, for me, the, way, the best way I can kind of teach people that change isn't dangerous is first share the obstacles and then how to defeat those obstacles. But a big component of that is engaging the head and the heart. Because I found that when organizations start, you know, they take their mission and vision, mission and vision going forward, but then they just, they, they spectacularly sabotage it by <laughs> jumping directly into ROI metrics and analytics. And so all these people that, that are communicating, I'm digging myself out of a hole every time I get introduced, right, by a CEO, because I, I come on the heels of all these boring PowerPoints <laughs> and whether you want to be the world's greatest bank, the most compassionate hospital, the most service oriented hotel, feelings are actually more influential than thought when it comes to affecting behavior and leading change and performance. It's how we feel in here about where we're going and what the plan is and what it looks like and my role in it. And if you can start to engage the head and the heart, then you've got people willing to give discretionary effort to something that's bigger than themselves and you, you've got something. So, so that's the big key. And that's, I think, why people keep calling and saying, hey, would you come and work with us? Because one, we don't understand the head heart process. Would you help us go a little bit deeper in that? And we don't know why we're stuck. And so, you know, identifying those things allows us to go. And so that's why I do what I do. Yeah. And I just got to say that you've got to be a talented communicator if you can follow on the heels of endless hours of PowerPoint presentations <laughs> with statistics. You got to be able to do your thing pretty well, Tom, if you can, if you can do that yeah. in, big, in big meetings. Hey, I, I want to thank you for being on the show today. But I, I just want to point out a couple of things that you've heard from Tom already the unbeatable guys and gals are not those that have been dealt with difficult circumstances and they've got the physical strength, they've got the stamina to endure it. As you just heard from Tom a moment ago, it's the guy or the gal with an unbeatable heart. It's the heart that gives them the courage to get back up and to get back in there, to dust themselves off and to not let circumstances overwhelm them. You also heard Tom say, and I will probably carry this with me af long after this episode is gone, you know, the real solution to pressure, high pressure situations is preparation. And when you're feeling the pressure, make sure that you're prepared before you even go in to circumstances like that. Hey, if you have the heart to be unbeatable, like you just heard from Tom, I want to thank you for listening to this episode. And I also want to thank you for just tuning in from home. Don't forget that you can find this podcast and follow us on social media just about anywhere. Search for at Unbeatable Podcast. And also, you can join the Unbeatable Army by going to unbeatablearmy.com and joining our email list. Keep in mind what you heard from Tom today. When the pressure gets high and when the stress is really on you, it's the guy or the gal that prepared the most that will always perform the best. Thanks for joining us today. See you next time.